Great. Thanks, Kate. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence here. And um, we just pray that as we look at your word together, that you would inspire us, you'd send your Holy Spirit, and you'd minister to us. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to um, begin by getting you to think about uh, your kingdom. Or if you, I don't, know what, I don't know what the female equivalent of a kingdom is, a queendom, I guess, or uh, an empire. And um, I want to set out the, the challenge at the beginning of this evening that we all have our own little kingdoms. And some of these little kingdoms are kingdoms um, which involve other people, and some of them are just the individual kingdom that we have. So let me, think, let me give you some examples, and I want you to think about what yours might be. So for example, if you head a team at work or lead a department, you might say that that team that you head up is your kingdom. It's not a bad thing. I'm not going to criticize you for that. It's, it's, that's your kingdom, if you like. That's your thing that you're in charge of. It might be that you run your own business. And I know one or two of you here run, have, have a business, that you run your own business. And in many ways, your business is your little kingdom. It's your empire, not in a bad way, but it's your realm. It's what you are in charge of. For some of you, your kingdom might be your family. You might have a sense that you are um, senior in your family. And your family might be, again, your kingdom. Or it might just be in terms of your friendships. Maybe you have a friendship group and you know that you, within your friendship group, you're kind of senior. You're like one of the kind of leaders in that friendship group. And again, I think that could be described as a little mini kingdom that you are in charge of. And I think we all have our little kingdoms. We have it in churches, don't we? This is Andy's kingdom, and I am his prince. No, that's just sounds, <laughs> you know, no, that's, take, take all that wrong back. But, you know, the, we, we, and, and some of us lead life groups, and in a way, our life groups are our little kingdoms. But then, of course, on the other hand, we also have kingdoms. We are all individually people who have our own individual kingdom. I will wake up tomorrow morning and I will make choices about my life, as you will. You will make choices about where you're going to spend your money. You're going to make choices about where you give your time. You will make choices about the decisions you're going to make. Some of you at school or, or in sixth form are making choices about what comes next. We make choices all the time. And in a sense, we are the kings of our kingdom, and we make those choices. We also make choices about who we invite to share our lives with. And some people we keep on the outside of our kingdoms, and other people we embrace into the center of our kingdoms. We all have our own little kingdom. Some of you have more than one kingdom. If you run a business and you feel like you uh, kind of have a family that you kind of have responsibility for and you have your individual, you, you're in three kingdoms. Now, none of these kingdoms are bad, but I just want you to hold on to that concept just as we talk about something else for a minute. I'm going to talk very briefly about, um, about boxing, um, bizarrely. I I'm, I'm really don't like boxing, so apologies, apologies if, you're into, if you're a boxer or you're really into boxing. But I don't, I, so I might be really out of this. I don't, know, I don't know anything about boxing, so I'm just making this up. But um, because there are two or three different boxing organizations, you can become heavyweight champion of the world at the same time that somebody else is also heavyweight champion of the world. Because one of them's boxing in this organization, and the other one's boxing for this organization, and they're both getting to the top of their boxing organizations, and they're both heavyweight champions of the world. Is that that, have I got that right? If anyone knows anything about boxing, that's right. Thanks, John. So what they sometimes do is you have heavyweight champion of the world over here and heavyweight champion of the world over here, and what they do is they have a unification fight. And what they do is the two organizations have a deal that they say, right, my, our champion of the world can fight your champion of the world to see who is the unified champion of the world. And when you're the champion of a boxing world, you get a belt. So you arrive at the boxing ring with your belt on, and you box the other champion of the world. It's, it's so far so good, yeah? And what happens is that the winner of that fight 
is the unified boxing heavyweight champion of the world, and they get to take the belt, so they have two belts, or sometimes even three belts, that symbolize that they are the top. They are the most important boxer. They are the greatest boxer. Right, let's hold on to that thought as well. So I want you to think about your kingdom, and I want you to think about heavyweight champions of the world as we talk about Jesus, which is obviously more important. Let's talk about Jesus. Um, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 49, which is one of Isaiah's servant songs, which talks about the Messiah, the king, we've been talking about kings, kingdoms, the king who is about to come. So let me read this, and it should come on the screen. He says, that's God, God says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who is despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Let's talk about Jesus, the Messiah, the king that was to come. What was this king going to do? The king, as we've just read, was going to restore the tribes of Judah. He was going to bring back the lost of Israel. He was going to be a light for the Gentiles. He was going to bring salvation to the very ends of the earth because he is the redeemer. And this is what Jesus does. This is what the king Jesus does. And he didn't just do it for the people of Israel back in Isaiah's time. He does this for us today. And I think he might want to do this for some of us this evening. He will restore the tribes of Jacob. Are you feeling broken? God wants to bring restoration. Are you feeling that you need to come home? God will bring back those of Israel. Perhaps you're feeling that your life is in darkness at the moment. There's a sense of darkness in your life. He will be a light to the Gentiles. Perhaps you just feel this evening you need saving from something, from someone, from yourself. He will bring his salvation to the ends of the earth. That's the king that we worship. That is the Jesus we worship. But the amazing thing about Jesus is, of course, he achieves this not in the ways that most kings over history have done. He doesn't achieve these things through power, through military might, through aggression, through authority. As we know, he achieves these things through being a servant. Verse 7 from that Isaiah passage describes the Messiah as the servant of rulers. He came to earth, this king, not to serve, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom. Because not only is he a servant king, he is the suffering servant king. He is the servant king who went to the cross and instead of being crowned with glory and honor, instead of being crowned with gold and riches and jewels, he was crowned with a crown of thorns, this symbol of his willingness to be the suffering servant king. That's the Jesus we worship. So, what is our response to this king of kings? What is our response to the suffering servant? I'd like us to just think about two things. We're going to th look at the passage again briefly, and then we're going to think about what that means for us. What does it mean? What, what's our response to this suffering servant king? Well, if we look back at the passage, we see that we read about the response that kings and princes have to the Messiah. Let me read it again. Verse 7. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down. That is the response that the most powerful people on the earth have to Jesus. They will stand up and they will bow down. Now, kings, I don't know much about being a king, obviously, but from, what, from watching The Crown and things like that, you can tell the queen and other 
sort of um, royalty, they never stand up unless they need to go somewhere, and then they expect everyone else to stand. No one sits down in the presence of a monarch unless the queen or the king themselves have sat down first. But we've just read here that kings will stand. Kings who have all the authority and the power, they will stand before this king. They will stand because they want to show respect, and they will stand in amazement about what this king has achieved. Without using power, without using military strength, without using violence, without using authority, but just using his humility and his suffering, he has achieved everything. Kings, when they get a true revelation of that, will stand before him. And princes, what will they do? Verse 7, they will bow down. Or in other translations, they will prostrate themselves. That means fall on the floor before this suffering servant king. They will fall on their faces in homage in response to this king. You know what? This isn't just, um, this isn't just kind of metaphorical because there are lots of examples across history where kings and queens and emperors and rulers have actually done this. Napoleon. Napoleon once said this, Napoleon, what a powerful, aggressive, mighty man, a military man, a conqueror. And he said this about the servant king. He said this, he said, everything in Christ, everything in the suffering servant king, everything astonishes me. His spirit overawes me and his will confounds me. Between him and whoever else in the world there is, there is no possible term of comparison. This mighty Napoleon, this great military leader, said that no one compares to the suffering servant. And what about our own queen? What about Queen Elizabeth? I think we all know that she puts her trust in the King of Kings. In fact, for her 90th birthday about five years ago, the, um, there was a book that came out that was written, and it was called The Servant Queen and the king she serves. I don't know if any of you read that book. But it highlights that she is a queen who holds her authority beneath a higher authority. And she follows the suffering servant king. So as I finish, I want to turn it back to us. I want to turn it back to us because... I want us to think about the kingdoms that we've identified for ourselves. You see, just like those kings and those princes, when we truly encounter Jesus, when, we, when the Holy Spirit convinces us of the truth and the revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done, when we really believe that and accept that, we too, with the kings, will stand in awe and respect. And with the princes, we will bow down and worship. And in many ways, what we do is we metaphorically take off the crowns of our own kingdom and we put them under his authority. Queen Victoria, apparently, I've not, I've not been able to um, verify this historically. I should have asked Jeff or someone who knows these things. But Queen Victoria apparently wished so much for Jesus' second coming because she longed to literally remove her crown and lay it at his feet. That's what she wanted to do. Because she, like Queen Elizabeth, followed the King of Kings. And she wanted to do that. So my challenge for us all this evening is simply that. Are you, go back to your kingdom that we talked about before. That I got you to think about. Let's take your business, for example. Your biz business is brilliant, okay. There's nothing wrong with having the kingdom of your business. But what we need to do as followers of the suffering servant king is to say, okay, this is my business, but it's going to come under the authority of a higher authority. And at the moment, it's my kingdom, but actually, I want it to be Jesus' kingdom. Or maybe it's your family. Families are brilliant things. Family are fantastic things. But rather than say, this is my family, I think the challenge is to say, Actually, I'm going to take off the crown of my authority in my family and I'm going to put it 
under God's authority, under Jesus' authority. I want him to be the king of my household. What about, what about the, um, your friendship circles? If you're one of the leaders in your friendship circles, or you're one of the leaders in your team at work, or you're a leader in a life group, those are kingdoms that you lead. That's great that you do that. But we need to take off those crowns from our own head, like Queen Victoria, and put them at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, you're in charge. You are in charge of my life. Our kingdoms need to become his kingdom. This is what I was thinking about the boxing thing. It's almost like you get these two heavyweight champions of the world, and they've both got their belts. They've both got their symbols of power and victory and winning and greatness. And when you get one of them in the ring with the other one, we see who really is the best boxer in the world. And the best boxer gets to take the belt from the other one. Now, we don't fight Jesus in a boxing ring. It's not a competition. But when we encounter Jesus, it's like we step into the boxing ring with him and we realize that although we thought we were doing pretty well, he is far more deserving of his belt. He is far more deserving of his throne. He is far more deserving of his crown. And in humility, we take off our belt and say, God, I can't compete with you. You are truly the greatest. And I want you to be the best and the king and the ruler over my life. When we worship, as we've done already, and we're going to do again in a moment, what we're doing in singing our songs is almost sacramental in a way, because when we sing these songs in worship, what we're doing is we're reflecting the attitude of our hearts and our minds. And isn't it interesting that often the words we use in the songs are often these kind of words? How many times do we sing, we bow? We bow our hearts. We bow down. What do the princes do? They bow before the king. And we sing, we bow. Sometimes we even sing, I stand amazed in the presence. Just like those kings who stand amazed, we stand amazed. And when we sing that, we're reflecting what's happening in our hearts. How often do we sing about Jesus being the king? How often do we sing about surrender? I surrender. It's just a song, but it's not just a song because it's a statement of what's going on in our hearts. As, some, as an ex-worship leader myself, being married to a worship leader and uh, working with Andy Dollison wherever he's sat, um, and any, any of you else who've been in here about um, who've, who've uh, led worship, will know that sometimes one of the frustrating things is when people don't like the worship you've done. And I just want to throw that out as a gentle challenge because worship is not for us. I know that's obvious, but sometimes we need that gentle reminder. Worship is about singing songs which speak of what's going on in our hearts. We sing the songs to reflect the fact that we're bowing before the King of Kings. And I know we don't like all the songs always, and sometimes we don't enjoy coming to sing, and, and sometimes that's just human, and that's okay, but that's not what it's about. We come to worship because we want to position ourselves at the foot of the King of Kings, the suffering servant king. So my challenge, two challenges for us. I don't know whether we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Kate. We might go into some worship now. We might, I don't know, we'll do whatever. But my challenge is two challenges tonight. When we worship, position your heart before the King of Kings and say, I want you to be king. And when we sing the words, let that be a reflection of what's actually happening on the inside for you. And the second challenge is when you get up tomorrow morning, you go to school, you go to college, you go to work, you deal with your family, you see your friends, make sure Jesus is the king. Make sure those places are Jesus' kingdom and not just your little kingdom. Let's release those places to him and allow him to be king of kings in our lives. Amen.